I want to um, first uh, thank Future Focus Media uh, Collective for filming this event. And Future Focus will be putting some of the raw footage up on uh, YouTube immediately after the event, and then I think doing some other things with it as well. Um, so make sure to look for that. Um, and I want to just say very, very briefly a couple things about sort of our intentions and goals for the day. So at its core, a solidarity economy is about creating economic relationships, enterprises, and practices that allow us to act ethically towards each other and towards the environment. That allow us to act collectively rather than as individuals. That allow us to share resources and decision making rather than compete against each other over imagined scarce resources. It's about envisioning and creating a, a new world. And I think at our conference last year, I think the conference was very, very successful at helping to locate and make visible the full range of economic possibility, looking at alternative forms of production, exchange, alternative forms of consumption. But this year, we want to do a little bit more. We want to make sure that we have a more int intentional conversation about how we can better build a movement that can get us where we want to go, where we need to go. That can build a broad, inclusive, politicized solidarity economy. A movement that can combine efforts for resistance and policy reform with anti-oppression efforts and with alternative economic development. And so this plenary is intended to sort of establish that, to kind of create a frame that we hope um, people can be in, in dialogue with throughout the day, in the workshops, in our interactive activities, in our informal conversations. And we want to be able to continue this conversation and come up with some questions, maybe some uh, uh, input solutions about how to move forward and build this movement, and bring it to the closing session where we'll, we'll actually create some concrete next steps. So we encourage all of you to stay throughout the day um, and help us to think carefully about how to do this. So with that, um, I'm going to introduce the uh, plenary speakers all at once, so we can sort of save some time, and then you can just come up. I'm going to introduce them in order in which they'll be speaking, and then you can just kind of start to introduce yourself when you come up. Um, OK. So first, uh, we have Penn Lowe. And Penn Lowe is a professor of practice at Tufts University's Department of Urban Environmental Policy and Planning. He has served in uh, various roles with um, ACE, Alternatives for Community Environment, a Roxbury-based environmental justice group. He holds an MS in environmental science um, and policy from uh, Energy and Resources Group of the University of California, Berkeley, and a BS in electrical engineering from MIT. And he's currently a board member of the New World Foundation and the Massachusetts Energy Facilities Society Board. Emily Kuano will speak after Penn. Emily is an economist and the director of the Center for Popular Economics and the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network. She taught economics at UMass Amherst and Smith College, probably some other places too, and worked as the National Economic Justice Representative of the American Friends Service Committee. She is currently involved in the Wellspring Initiative, a project to create a network of worker-owned sustainable cooperatives in Springfield, Massachusetts, through the purchasing power of large local institutions like universities, hospitals. Asa Nito uh, will, actually, Daniel Teagle, um, who is Skyping in, um, will speak after Emily, and uh, Daniel is this giant um, head right here, <laughs> so, um, watching over us, um, the authority figure in the solidarity economy. Um, uh, Daniel has a master's in theoretical physics at the University of, Com of Campinas. Um, he's a former executive secretary of the Brazilian Forum of, so of Solidarity Economy uh, until 2001. He's a member of EITA, a solidarity economy enterprise which develops free information technologies and popular methodologies for its usage um, to support the struggles of social movements. Since 2012, uh, Daniel has been working as the operations manager of the Intercontinental Network for the Promotion of Social and Solidarity Economy. After Daniel, um, Asa Needle uh, will give a presentation. Asa is the coordinator of outreach and education at the Worcester Roots Project here in Worcester and a member of the Stone Soup Community Center. He has facilitated workshops and trainings around the region on several topics, ranging from environmental justice to youth worker cooperatives, 
Um, okay. ASA is dedicated to creating connections and coalitions between people of diverse ages and backgrounds. And he recently won the prestigious Brower Youth Award, fantastic, uh, for his leadership in environmental activism and achievements with the Toxic Soil Busters Co-op. And then finally, the final speaker um, will be Tim Fisk. Tim is the executive director of the Alliance to Develop Power. He has played a key role in the creation and development of ADP's innovative community economy model that combines community organizing, community building, and alternative economic development in Western Massachusetts. He began working with ADP as a finance consultant in 2003, coming on full time as the managing director in 2007, and most recently taking the helm as executive director in May of 2011. His background in economic development has contributed to the creation of an alternative economy currently valued at $45 million, creating 49 permanent living wage jobs and building a cross-sector grassroots base of 5,000. ADP's community economy injects $20 million annually into the local economy. Okay, so with that, I think, um, I think we can um, around green solidarity economy. So, who here wants to give a hip hip hooray for green solidarity economy, yeah? All right, all right. How about a democratic economy? Yeah. How about a cooperative economy? How about the community economy? How about a living economy? A generative economy? A local economy? A new economy? A new and improved economy? I put all those words out there because I feel like there's been an explosion of these words to label something that many of us desire deeply, and we're still having some trouble describing it. You know, there's not a, enough clarity around what all these different words mean, but I think it does show that many of us are striving, trying to figure out what is that economy that we want to be part of creating and that we want to live in. I want to just give you a little personal pet peeve that I have. Um, I prefer not to use the word alternative. And I say that because to me, sometimes alternative implies that, well, we can just choose to do something different. That it's like a lifestyle. It suggests perhaps that we can opt out of the economy that we have. Also, in a way, I feel like it's self-marginalizing. So just, if you want to humor me, don't use the word alternative. <laughs> so why are we here today to talk about green solidarity economy? Well, I'd like to think that we're all here because we're looking for some answers that get us towards a real transformation of the economy that we have to live in now. That economy some people would describe as global, as capitalism, neoliberal. And we have to talk about a transformation because this economy is literally killing us. A lot of people talk about it as the dual crises, economic and environmental. So let's just quickly review on a global basis. We have unconscionable wealth inequality. Right. The Occupy movement last year, I think, put a frame around that. We have a 1% that's getting rich and richer at the expense of the rest of us. I find it incredible that every time I hear the statistics that the richest 400 Americans own more than the bottom half of the entire U.S. population, over 150 million of us, you know, how can that be? I mean, 400 people fits into my kids' elementary school. 400 people control more wealth than half of the entire population of the U.S. Right? That accumulation is based on a system that is based on the idea that we can grow endlessly, that we can keep exploiting the natural resources of our Mother Earth that the pollution that that generates, well, we know it's going to literally cook the planet and lead to climate catastrophe. So that's globally, but let's not forget that here locally, here in our country and abroad, you know, we have a 
Maybe it's a bottom 30%. Maybe it's 40% now. Maybe that number is higher when you look across the world. But there's a lot of people in this world for whom the economy, this economy, has never worked very well. All right? If you believe the presidential debates, you know, maybe we had a booming 90s when everything used to be good. That we, we have an economy that we need to fix because it used to work. Well, for a lot of folks, it never worked. And a lot of us in this room, I think, are working because of the problems that have been generated by that economy. You know, so these are the folks that have been stuck at the bottom of the economic ladder. They've never been part of the middle class, even if they thought they were. These are the folks that are being dumped on by the pollution, right? The environmental racism that we've been talking about. Here in this state, even, this blue Massachusetts state, we, the most recent studies still show incredible environmental disparities. 24 of the 30 most overburdened environmentally polluted communities in Massachusetts are communities of color. There's only 34 of them in the entire state, according to this one study. So why are we here to talk about a green solidarity economy? Because we have to. Right? It's a matter of survival for many of us. For all of us, though, it's a matter of creating the kind of economy and the kind of world that we want to live in, that we think represents our values, about what is morally right, about what makes a good life. So the question, I think, for many of us, uh, and the main topic for today is which way forward? Which ways are forward? And this is a question that isn't just hypothetical or abstract, right? We get presented with different answers to that every day. Many of them we don't like, and I'll just point to one example. We passed Walmart on the way in on the highway. Well, Walmart, as we know, is pushing into urban areas, right? Our cities, our neighborhoods are their next market, their next way to make profit. Two summers ago, they announced plans to push into the Boston area. So a lot of our community groups were wondering, so what do we do? Right, we know that Walmart, they've been stopped for now but they're not going away. They're going to continue to try to push in. Some of you in this room may have been involved in anti-Walmart activism. And they're so easy to hate, aren't they? Because we know that they symbolize so much of what's wrong with global capitalism, right? From exploitation of workers and the environment, to destroying our main streets and local businesses, right? To bribing governments. But I think almost all of us know people, the folks that we claim to represent or work on behalf of, that they would love some of those jobs to become a Walmart associate, even if it's crappy. They'd like access to the fresh food at affordable prices. Right? So it's not as easy as just saying no. We can say no, but what are we going to be doing instead? I just want to frame that a little bit clearer to give a little more sense of the complexity here. So let's say we pose Walmart at a particular site in our community. We fight for two, three years. Scenario one, we win. They actually don't come in. Do we have any idea about what's next? Are we just waiting for a Target to come in? Or a Costco? Right? Would that be better? What if Walmart actually does come? And because we've resisted and we've had built political power, we're able to leverage some community benefits. Right? We get them to put a few more solar panels on their roofs. We get maybe a dollar better per hour for the workers. Right? Maybe that's what the, the struggle against Walmart is all about. But I think the fundamental question still remains, are we on a different path? Right? What is it worth fighting for in the daily struggles in our communities that actually gets us towards transformation? 
You know, in the Walmart question, it's easy to hate Walmart and say, no, this is the wrong direction on a big picture scale, but at the local community scale, it is much more complex. Did you know that uh, Walmart has positioned themselves now to be the answer to food deserts? Right? They say last year they said they're going to open up 300 stores in the food deserts defined by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. 40,000 associates apparently will be hired and working at those stores, supposedly. Did you know that uh, Will Allen, the founder of uh, Growing Power, a pioneering urban farm in Milwaukee, he had to defend accepting a $1 million grant from Walmart Foundation. And here's what he said. He said, uh, Walmart is the world's largest distributor of food. There's no one better positioned to bring high quality, locally grown food into urban food deserts. Okay? So are we really, are we just trapped in this economy? Or do we have ideas and strategies about how we might get on a different path? One where we can start to build and fight locally, as well as fight and help lead towards transformation globally. So I'd argue that the vision part is not necessarily our hardest challenge. There are plenty of great visions out there. Many of you in this room are the holders and creators of those. But I think our challenge is getting to broader agreement and getting to the shared belief that another world, another economy is possible. Because for many of us who have a hard time imagining life beyond this economy, it seems like it's so far away. It's a pipe dream, right? What we need is more people to say, I have a dream and mean it like Martin Luther King. Mean that it's something we think is actually attainable. The way we move towards that is by starting to see evidence that it's happening. Finding ways that we can actually start doing the things that we aspire to. And that's why I'm so happy to be here today. We've got all my fellow panelists. We've got Wellspring, we've got ADP, we've got Worcester Roots. We can learn and be inspired by that. From Brazil, many places outside the US have much, much more developed movements and infrastructure. But once we start to share that dream, we have an even tougher challenge, which is what are the strategies and actions that we can start to take locally? And just drawing from a lot of the work I've been doing with different groups, um, there are a few key questions that I'd like to throw out and close with that I think some of you have been grappling with as well. You know, one, how do we start to plant the seeds of transformation and cultivate the shoots that have started to come up? Right? How do we spread the dialogue and help our community share in the dream? What are the assets and capacities that we can already build off from, that already exist? What are the public policies and demands on public resources that we need to make to make our vision possible? How do we actually know if any of the projects we're doing, the small steps, add up to transformation in the large picture? So again, I don't pretend to have any of the answers uh, to these questions, but I throw them out there because I feel like these are the ones that we're grappling with, that together we can start to come to some of those solutions. I'll leave you with just two thoughts. One is that I think in moving forward, we have to take a both and approach. We have to take an all of the above approach, right? No one, I don't think in this room, believes there's one and only one path. Right? Revolution is not just going to happen because capitalism is going to implode and will necessarily have a replacement. We have to take many paths to figure out what that might look like. We have to reform the old economy. So yeah, fighting for a better deal for Walmart workers is really important. We need those workers to have a better life so they can be part of creating the new economy that we're talking about here. We need to plant the seeds of that new economy and cultivate our own economies. And finally, I think what all this means is that none of our work can be seen in isolation. 
And I appreciate Boone using the word movement a lot in the opening, because I think the kind of change we're talking about really is about movement change, movement driven. And it has to happen at all levels. It's not just about having co-ops, and it's not just about having good policy campaigns. It's about having all that work together. So I'm really looking forward to a great day with you all. Thanks for having me.